Hello and welcome to the second episode of The Big Conversation Season 3. I'd love to know what you think of Nick Bostrom and Ros Picard's dialogue by filling out a brief survey. It's multi-choice and really quick. You can also receive bonus video content and updates from the series by subscribing to our newsletter at thebigconversation.show. So for the survey and the bonus content, check out the links in the info. Well, hello and welcome to The Big Conversation from Unbelievable, brought to you in partnership with the John Templeton Foundation. I'm Justin Briley and The Big Conversation is all about exploring the biggest questions of science, faith and philosophy with leading thinkers across the religious and non-religious spectrum. And today we're talking about God, artificial intelligence and the future of humanity and asking, is technology the key to immortality? Uh, This season is, of course, being recorded for obvious reasons remotely, but that does allow us to bring together some really interesting people from all over the globe. And joining me today are Nick Bostrom and Rosalind Picard. Nick Bostrom is the director of the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford and a leading voice in AI and technology. Nick's the author of Superintelligence, which warned of the possible dangers that the rapid development of artificial intelligence may pose globally. Rosalind Picard is director of Effective Computing at MIT, harnessing the power of AI to develop things like wearable technology, machine learning that predicts and responds to human emotion and well-being, um, helping people with autism, with epilepsy, depression and many other physiological conditions. So today with Nick and Roz, we're going to be looking at the future of AI and asking big questions like the ethics of AI. Uh, Could machines become conscious one day? Might we all be uploaded to some digital heaven? And what if we're all living in a universe simulated by godlike alien technology? Just a few of the the little questions in life. Um, So I'm really looking forward to this this program. Uh, So good to have you with me, Nick and Roz. Tell me, first of all, uh, we'll start with you, Nick. Um, You head up the Future of Humanity Institute. Uh, It sounds like something from a a sci-fi film or something. Are you basically there to sort of predict doomsday, you know, technological scenarios and just make sure they're averted? What what is it you do at the Institute? Yeah, especially the latter. Like if I could either predict or prevent, I would (laughs) choose to prevent. Uh, Well, we are a um, a interdisciplinary um, research group. Uh, We have computer scientists, mathematicians, philosophers, physicists, trying to um, get the clearer understanding of some of the really big picture questions um, regarding the future um, prospects for intelligent life, um, threats to the survival of the human species, and in particular, the levers, like where are the opportunities where by some modest effort now we might improve the expected value of the long-term future. And I mean, does that just involve a lot of sort of sitting around and thinking through issues? I mean, obviously, you have to keep abreast of all the latest developments, I suppose, in technology doing that. Yeah, well, um, a lot of our work is focused more on the kind of underlying uh, questions rather than, you know, what's next year's iPhone going to be like. We These kind of um, ripples on the great pond are not really our focus, but sometimes the most important questions are the ones that get the least attention. Um, So for example, Mm. if we continue to make impressive progress in machine intelligence, what happens down the line when AI finally succeed at not just automating specific tasks, but providing the same general kind of intelligence and problem solving that have made us humans unique on this planet. And, and other more, yeah, ways that the human condition could change in some more fundamental way. It's very much big picture stuff, obviously. Um, I I know you don't have any personal religious beliefs, Nick, uh, but does the issue of God ever come up in your research, questions around religion and that kind of thing? Um, Well, it comes up in my own thinking, not so much in the specific research products we are pursuing. Um, And I can't speak for all of my colleagues there. Um, But at some point, I think... If you zoom out enough and start to think about really what is the human condition all about and what might it lead to, um, you do start to butt up against theological concerns. Um, Unfortunately, that's also the point where my competence kind of runs out um, (laughs) to some extent. So uh, 
Um, but but yeah, I will we'll uh, be testing your competence a, a, a little bit on the program today, Nick, um, because I, I, I would love to open up some of those metaphysical questions that the AI pose around consciousness, um, ethics and, and even the God question at, at some level. Um, but but we'll, we'll start, obviously, by talking about AI and, and what some of the possibilities and challenges are. Um, before we do that, Roz, welcome to the show as well. Um, now, you've p pioneered this this field of effective computing for over two decades, I think. Tell us, firstly, what it is and what sort of things you've been developing in the process. Yeah, effective computing is computing that relates to, arises from, or deliberately influences emotion. The original idea was that computers were driving us nuts. They were so stupid and frustrating. And the kind of intelligence we wanted to build for the future AI was not uh, just playing games like chess or Go uh, or using language or solving math, but was not being annoying, right? A, a computer or a robot that you would actually want to have around and that if you were uh, frustrated or pleased, it would see that, use that as feedback and learn to do better and have skills for how to manage uh, emotion, not just uh, recognizing them, but knowing how to help us uh, manage our emotions in respectful ways, always with deference for people's feelings, not sensing things if we don't want them uh, and so forth. So I saw it as a hierarchy out of wanting to respect people's feelings and that these were skills that we could teach computers how to do better at. And and what has that d resulted in, in terms of some of the practical applications that, you, that you've been able to uh, engineer in the process? We have been surprised. In the beginning, the idea, I think, was, was very much about, like, what would a robot do? What would a software agent do in interacting with a person to be intelligent? And what might happen deep inside a machine that most people don't see that might be like how the human brain works that might um, enable it to think more intelligently, not that computers think like we do, uh, but to have processes that give it better uh, flexibility and generalizability and things like that. We uh, have actually found that there are a lot more applications than that. And many applications have to do with human health. Uh, for example, we learned that the fundamental mechanisms inside us when we're having feelings communicate with pretty much every organ in the body. And when you look at the messages they carry, uh, they change when people are healthy or sick. And by uh, paying attention to these unseen aspects of our emotion system, uh, we could help people have better health. So we have been uh, working on a lot of cool things that have come out of that. Like we accidentally developed a seizure detector. Uh, that, well, actually it became the focus of Ming Zerpo's PhD thesis and the focus of a spin out company, Empatica, uh, that's now an FDA cleared device that I'm wearing here called Embrace. But we've, we've um, followed the data where it goes and uh, wherever we can, looked to see how if we can steer it to help make lives better. Well, well, in that sense, it, it sounds very much like you're obviously harnessing technology for for a wonderful end, um, even if there may be potential pitfalls in other parts of you know the the AI story. Um, before we we start talking about that, I'm fascinated a little bit about your own faith journey because I think you had an adult conversion to Christianity yourself, Roz. So, so how does someone who's evidently intelligent, scientifically minded, end up believing in God. There's uh, there's some longer versions of this. People can read if they go to places like Christianity Today or, or other talks. Uh, but the short version is I was an atheist and a skeptic and a very proud one. And when I was challenged to read the best-selling book of all time, the one that is so best-selling they leave it off the bestseller list because it dwarfs everything else each week. Uh, as I read that book, I started to realize there was a lot of wisdom and intelligence in that book and that it wasn't just a bunch of uh, goofy made up stuff that I thought it might be when I went to read it. And through a process of reading, asking questions and many years of gathering data about it, actually, uh, I gradually felt myself changing. I became somebody who started to uh, believe not only was a possible God existed, but maybe it was more probable than not. And I started to, uh, see if that made a difference in my life and then gradually started to embrace the Christian uh, worldview. And that has actually made a huge difference in my life. Mm -hmm. So now I've run the experiment both ways and I definitely prefer the Christian worldview. <laughs> and, and again, just briefly, how, how would you say that that particular change in your own life has impacted 
your career, your scientific work and everything? Yeah, it's, you know, the, it's funny when Nick was saying, you know, we bump up against the boundary of theology. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, uh, Donald Knuth when he was visiting and he, he's a practicing Christian, a very famous computer scientist. And when he came to speak about theology, he said, when it comes to theology, mind you, everybody in the room thought he was the world expert on computer science. Uh, he says, but when it comes to theology, I'm a user, not a developer. <laughs> um, <laughs> we aren't inventing that, right? There's some truth there that we are barely catching a glimpse of. Um, and in my work, I the more I learn about how the human mind works and how the human emotion system works and all, I'm just in awe. I'm in awe of how uh, fearfully and wonderfully we are made. And it inspires me. And uh, another key piece of my faith is that all people are of equal worth. And that has driven my uh, willingness to work on topics with people who are often stigmatized for conditions that other people uh, didn't value so much. Uh, they didn't value those people so much because they had those conditions, which is a horrible tragedy. And uh, knowing from my faith, this view that we're all uh, of equal worth, I have uh, you know, spent a lot of time learning from them and it has just been tremendously productive in terms of just wonderful relationships, wonderful insights. And now pretty much all of our research has gone in pr really cool new directions uh, because of things we've learned from their different kinds of minds. It's great to hear that. Um, such an interesting area. I, I could spend the whole evening talking about that, but we've we've we, we've got all kinds of areas that we want to cover in today's program. Uh, I, I want to talk about well, firstly, the the future of AI and whether the the sci-fi movies have it right. Now, I don't know what what you think of this, Nick, but um, I guess ever since things like two thousand and one, a space odyssey, you know, where you've got Hal um, basically saying. I can't do that, Dave, um, and that sort of thing. We've we've had this fear that technology will one day essentially get a mind of its own and work against us in some way. Um, how broadly optimistic or pessimistic are you about those kinds of foreboding challenges around AI, Nick? I'd say I'm a fretful optimist. Um, I think it's going to be transformative and that both very, very good outcomes and very bad outcomes are potentially in the cards. Um, and we have a lot of ignorance as to how these kinds of things play out. We've never seen a transition to a machine intelligence era before. We don't have that much evidence to go on. Um, so some quite large amount of uncertainty uh, uh, seems appropriate in terms of our expectations. I mean, what are some of the potential challenges or even pitfalls that you anticipated in superintelligence? And I'm aware the book came out a few years ago now. So do you think that the landscape has changed a great deal in terms of people's, I suppose, awareness of, of some of these areas of risk? It has changed a great deal. I think, well, first, in terms of actual AI capabilities, I think progress has been faster um, than was generally expected back in, say, 2014, when the book came out. Um, really exciting developments in deep learning and a lot of things every year. Um, another way in which the situation has changed is that when I wrote the book, it was um, partly to draw attention to the need to do research in advance of um, how to align very powerful AI systems uh, with human intentions or other ways making them safe and controllable. Um, back then, it was an extremely neglected area. Um, uh, it was kind of relegated to science fiction authors to just make up fun and interesting stories like the one about Hal and many, many others. But that was not like, I mean, you have people being paid to do research on the dung beetle and there's like a whole community with peer-reviewed uh, articles studying every aspect of the dung beetle's life and physiology, but uh, but this didn't seem to qualify. Uh, but that has changed in the years that have passed. There is now a vibrant research community working on uh, the alignment problem, and we, we are in fact doing. We have a group doing that at the Future of Humanity Institute, but at, at DeepMind, at OpenAI, and at a number of other places, there are now some really smart people working on this. 
I mean, do do you consider that there is a genuine threat at some point in the future of some kind of, you know, cybernet type situation developing where AI will get to the point where it becomes self-aware and develops its own, you know, attitude towards the world and how things should be run and turns into some kind of cyber dictator? I mean, is that just sci-fi as far as you're concerned or, or is it a, a genuine thing that could happen if we didn't, you know, keep keep an eye on and and you know, moderate the way we, we, we develop AI? Well, it's easy to anthropomorphize AI systems and that usually uh, blocks understanding. But it is true that if you have very powerful optimization processes where you have some kind of learning mechanism that tries to gradually improve performance against some specified objective, um, that you often find that the ways in which the system goes about meeting the objective is unexpected and, and sometimes undesired. And the potential for these kind of unexpected and undesirable way of meeting the nominal specification that we have put in increase the more capable, the more creative, the more intelligent the system becomes. And so if we like extrapolate beyond the systems where we are now, where it's easy to go in afterwards and tweak it and change it if we don't like, but if we imagine that one day this might be smarter than humans and therefore extremely capable and maybe extremely powerful, then um, it does seem that we are faced with a, a big challenge here to figure out how to actually align a super intelligence, something that is maybe way smarter than we are, and construct it in such a way that it is nevertheless on our side, a kind of extension of, of our volition. Um, so I'd say that there are really, maybe you could divide it into three categories. Um, of ways in which things could go wrong if we're unlucky in this transition. So one is this kind of AI running amok. Um, and the answer to that seems to be this kind of research to do the technical work to figure out how to align powerful AI systems. Um, the second category would be if, if these AIs become very powerful, they become very powerful tools. And we know if we just look at the history of technology that humans have used technologies for all kinds of purposes. Some evil. We use a lot of technologies to wage war against each other or to oppress each other. So there is a concern about if we have increasingly powerful tools, what will we do with them to each other? Uh, so that, broadly speaking, points in the direction of um, improving governance institutions and ethics and other practices. And we have mm. a group working on that. And, that. and then there's the third category as well, which is um, quite neglected, which is not just what the AI might do to us or what we might do to each other using AI tools, but what we might do to these digital minds. Um, if you think that at some point they might become moral subjects, if, if they can become conscious or otherwise maybe have some of the attributes that give rise to moral status, then I think there is a risk that we might uh, mistreat them um, and that uh, a, a great deal of morally undesirable consequences could flow from that i'd be, be really interested in your thoughts on this ros where 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 do you stand um nick says he's fretfully optimistic <laughs> i love the phrase of of the future of ai um what what what's your are you generally an optimist or worried about where things are heading yeah my my worries are maybe different than the ones usually parroted in the science fiction movies uh which are designed to be entertaining right and cataclysmic sure. Uh, I think the real worries right now are more that uh, people use AI to amplify the good or bad things they do. And there are people on our planet who don't share this ethic that all people have equal worth. They think they have more worth. And their uh, goal is to preserve and protect their power first and handle other people's needs uh, second to that. And many of them see an opportunity to use AI to uh, achieve their goals. Uh, and when they have a little power or more power than others, they take the AI and amplify that more. And that's a function that could uh, be very hard to restore some equity to. So my bigger worry actually is when um, very powerful people who don't have others' best interests in mind, or they may say they do, but they don't act that way, uh, they use the technology to consolidate yeah. their power. I see AI as not operating on its own. I see it as something we have made, and those things we've made are, uh, you know, we're ontologically superior to that which we make. 
not to that which we beget, but to that which we make. And that uh, we have to recognize there's somebody paying for that system uh, and they're getting money from somewhere and they've got power from some source. And that's where I think we have to keep our eye on the real worries. I think the rest of it is uh, Hollywood entertainment and distraction. What about Nick's contention that we, if we were to see an AI that became a moral agent? Um, I mean, you, you've been developing um, software and hardware to, to, to measure our feelings. What if AI developed feelings of its own? Yeah, it's not going to have feelings like we do, but we can make it look like, I mean, already can make it look like it has feelings. And people have already done uh, moral attachment to things that aren't AI, right? I don't know how many people, I, I remember as a 16 year old, the car I had saved my money to buy and babied and take care of. And then uh, one day I sold it to somebody else and when it drove away, you know, I was like, Ooh, you know, tears of this thing and you treat it like a baby and people name their things. Right. And we did this even Am before. They am AI. Am am I'm trying to get the word out here. Anthropomorphize them as, as Nick right. said. Yes. Right. We do that. And we don't want, you know, and I, there's examples, for example, you take a little toy robot and make it. A, so, for example, when iRobot first did this doll that was on the market and they took it off uh, called My Real Baby, and it was the first robotic baby doll, they uh, had to have this decision about whether or not the doll would cry and what would make the doll cry. And they did make the doll cry, but they decided that if somebody strung it up by its toes and started abusing it, that they would not make it scream or cry because that could actually oogle on the sick mm. kind of person who gets mm. a sick delight out of doing that to something that looks like a baby. And even knowing it's not, it still pushes our buttons. It makes us feel yeah. as if it yeah. is yeah. because it looks that mm. way. So we don't want to... Um, you know, we have to recognize people will feel that way. They will see that in things, uh, even with, you know, 10 years ago, AI, uh, much less the future, it will continue. Um, and we need to be careful about what we uh, yeah. subject yeah. people to there. In fact, there's interest in using robots for helping um, deal with uh, people who have problems with things like sexual abuse or assault or, or not caring about somebody else's feelings, could the robot help them uh, get some role playing in a way that doesn't hurt another person? Yeah. I mean, Nick, interesting to hear Roz say that she doesn't think ultimately um, a robot or um, a piece of AI will feel in the same way that we do. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether you want to clarify that, Roz. Do, do, do you think that this idea of a consciousness a, 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 yeah. in the way that we have conscious, you, you don't think that's going to be a reality in, in AI terms? Well, I, I won't say it, it won't ever happen because we don't know what we don't know, right? We, we can't say uh, something is 100% impossible because uh, we're often surprised. I can say that with uh, decades of super bright minds working on all different kinds of computation, um, biological computers, uh, silicon computers, you know, quantum, we do not see something that looks like uh, conscious experience or emotional experience happening. And so we don't see a path to building it. It doesn't, it's not something that's just going to go poof, here it is with this much faster of a machine or this many more uh, transistors or something, right? It's okay. not well, about the parameters we know. Okay. Well, what's your take on that, Nick? Do you, do you think there could be a, a consciousness at some point from an AI? Yeah. I mean, it's not completely obvious whether current AI systems say Alpha Zero, would, I mean, how sure were, were that they are not conscious in whatever sense, maybe insects are conscious, uh, maybe some small animal, if, if the capabilities, the learning abilities and so forth, the behavioral repertoire starts to become comparable to animals where a lot of humans would at least not feel confident that there is not even a glimmer of consciousness, then it seems our confidence that these AI systems do not have similar kind of internal life starts to seem a bit shaky. Um, and certainly as we're you know, like moving, you know, over the coming years towards like things that maybe become more mouse like, let's say, most of us would probably think mice have the ability to experience uh, pain and to suffer, to be hungry and to have other mental states. Um, um, and combining that with our lack of like a really solid uh, account of necessary and sufficient conditions for conscious experience. It, it seems like um, 
at least the uncertainty would spill over into hypotheses where some of these systems will have some degree of consciousness long before you reach kind of human level capabilities. Um, and certainly I think it is possible in principle to have say a digital computational system that, that would be fully conscious. Um, in fact, I think indistinguishable from the kind of consciousness that we humans have. How, how, how would you know, I suppose, is my question, Nick, because inevitably, you know, we could, we can probably develop fairly soon and maybe we already are, you know, algorithms and technologies that pass the Turing test where you, you would talk to it and you wouldn't know you were talking to a, a computer. But as far as I'm aware, it's still just a set of algorithms. It's ones and zeros. It doesn't mean anything to the machine. How would you ever know? It's a kind of like the zombie problem, isn't it? How would you ever know that you really are talking to a conscious being and not just an incredibly clever set of algorithms? I mean, you could kind of ask the same when you're talking to uh, like Rosalind or me, how you can know that we really are conscious and are not just like cleverly mimicking the th types of behavior that the conscious being would exhibit. Um, and it seems, broadly speaking, we might point to two types of criteria. So one is um, what functionally uh, are we capable of doing? Like if, if we can like respond intelligently to your questions and react to your actions and so forth, that would seem to point uh, to the presence of a mind. And I don't think it's really the case that we right now have the ability to pass the Turing test. Well, we have to be careful what we mean by it. There are sort of crummy versions of it that you could pass by by means of cheap hacks. So if you have some naive judges who don't know like the, the real questions to ask, they will all ask the same kind of questions. Uh, and like in the limiting case, you could just imagine kind of having hard-coded answers to the most commonly asked questions. And then probably you could trick some people for two minutes in in an interview quite easily. And you could do a little bit better than that with current kind of big language models and so forth. But like actually doing like a half hour interrogation with people who know how to kind of probe, that's way beyond current capabilities. Um, but anyway, so those kind of um, functional capability related um, criteria would be one basis. Like another you might try to point to is the internal architecture. Some people might think it's not enough to replicate the input-output functionality of, 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 say, a human. For it to have the same mental experience, the internal organization would also have to be sufficiently similar. Um, and there, of course, then the question arises, at, at what level of similarity? Uh, is it sufficient if you have, say, implemented yes. in silicon the same kind of computational processes, or, or do you need some lower-level isomorphism as well? Um, yeah. But you could have both the same computational structure in principle in a digital computer and the same input output behavior. And I think that would ground a very strong claim to having the same so, kind of so, conscious experience. So why Ros are you why Ros are you more skept why are you more skeptical of all of this, Ros? <laughs> well well there's functional similarity, okay, where something acts like something and where we uh, give it a bunch of specifications and say if it does these things then you know, it, it jumps over this hoop and we label it something like we label it consciousness level 0 0.2 or something. And we can we can do that anytime. The more specifically we define the functions, the more likely we are to get the computer to be able to succeed at them in a constrained environment. We're, we're very good if we can specify all possible things that it should do or behave or patterns of them uh, within a space of programming the computer to do things like that. I have ideas how to program it so that it will look conscious and uh, you, you know, take a list of functions of consciousness and make it look that way. Uh, but am I deceived that it actually is? No, it's just looking like it is. And there is a difference. Uh, it may not be a functional difference in an interaction. Uh, there are times, you know, when you call for help for service on your computer or something and the person's just going through a list. I'm like, oh my gosh, my you know, you're more like a computer than my computer is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? There are times when we just act according yeah. to this set of procedures, but we know uh, that we have more to us than that, right? We know that we can be motivated by love, that we can be motivated by uh, feelings and experiences that transcend these functional approximations that, that I program. 
And I know that because I program them. And I also know that if I didn't program them, that machine wouldn't act that way. It doesn't care. It doesn't yeah. feel. It doesn't think it, or know. And when Deep it, Blue it, was switched off at the end of its amazing victory, it didn't care. It, it sounds almost like there's, there is a theological issue at stake for you here, though, Roz, I wonder. I mean, obviously, as, as a Christian, you believe humans are made in the image of God. There's a sort of divine spark, if you like. Is it? Does that for you kind of cause you to, to sort of be sceptical that we could somehow recreate that from the ground up? You know, we, we could from the dust create a, a soul um, because that's ultimately God's prerogative in, in your view. Actually, it gives me um, may, maybe a, a little more boldness than, than that in the other direction. Uh, I believe uh, because of uh, belief in the existence of God and you know, the lines at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, you know, that now we see as through a glass dimly, but then face to face, right? What does that mean? That at some future point, we will see face to face and not just like a face, but it goes on to say, and then we shall be known even as we are fully known. And that's like, holy cow, we are fully known, right? That tells me that our consciousness may actually be algorithmically specified. Uh, by someone, that it is fully known. And I know Nick has written about somebody simulating all of this, perhaps. Uh, and so what's really cool is that that actually says, St. Paul says there, that we are fully known. Now, we also have a choice of whether or not we choose to be fully known. And that's pretty interesting, too. And if we are fully known by one that we don't only see like through a glass dimly, then, then that gives me hope that actually we will someday be able to understand completely how we work and that then it is a solvable, identifiable mm. uh, problem. Uh, so maybe yeah. that's not the answer you expect from a Christian. No, no. But that's, <laughs> that it that's, actually, that's I'm actually really more hopeful than some of my colleagues yeah. that it's yeah, completely that's, specified. That's, that's very interesting to hear in that sense. I mean, Nick, I, d I, I don't know whether this rings any bells with you, but um, you're, I guess you're, you're kind of agnostic on the God question. But would, would the development of a sort of some kind of genuine consciousness in AI would that swing the evidence away from God in the sense that it would show that life is can be, if you like, built from the ground up in a kind of materialistic way and therefore there isn't any need for the sort of the divine spark or, or anything? I don't think it would. I mean, it's hard to generalize because there are many different beliefs about God based on a lot of different experiences and evidence and arguments. So maybe some of those um would be contradicted by our actually creating a human level system but that would leave a lot of others um and it, it's hard to say there might be many different ladders on which people could climb up to some conviction about there being a higher plane of being and greater than human possibilities maybe, maybe this would be one of them so if you could actually bring into existence intellects greater than human intellects. It would kind of show the existence of space above us. If you have, we talked a little bit, Rosalind referred to, to my, my, some of my um, ideas about the simulation argument. Um, it can maybe open up the uh, horizon, even for somebody who starts out with a very naturalistic picture of the world that there could be a lot more um, in heaven and on earth than is kind of dreamt of when we just look around us and take a kind of naive realist interpretation of that. I was going to say talk um, to us about this um, simulation uh, because for those who aren't aware of what, what we're, we're, we're talking about here this simulation hypothesis what is it and uh, sketch it out for us and, and some of the implications of it. Um, so this is um, an, an, an argument um, which I published back in, I think, 2001 or 2002, um, that um, shows that one of three possibilities is true, although it doesn't tell us which one of these. So the first one is that almost all civilizations at our current level of development, if there are many in the universe, like almost all of those go extinct before they reach technological immaturity. Um, so that's possibility one. Kind of be sad if that were true, but it could be. Maybe we all invent some dangerous technology that destroy. Uh, okay, so the second possibility is that out of the civilizations that do reach technological maturity, 
um, there is a very strong convergence in that they virtually all decide not to use their immense computational resources to creating simulations, ancestor simulations, simulations of people like their forebears, simulations that would be conscious. Um, and we can discuss that. But the third possibility is uh, the simulation hypothesis, which is that we are living in a computer simulation. Uh, not in a metaphorical sense that the kind of laws of physics were usefully described like in terms of algorithms, but in the literal sense that we are inside some computer built by some advanced civilization. And so the simulation argument then it involves some probability theory and stuff, but um, yeah, it, it seems to show that um, at least one of these three possibilities is true. Um, and yeah, if, if we have, I mean, it probably take take like another five minutes or something like that. So depending on whether you want to, it, it tends to derail the conversation well, if you start to take, pull on it. I, I, that's fine. I, 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 I what I, I was going to ask was let, let's suppose that option three is is a genuine possibility. Um, uh, I mean, how, how how would that make you you feel personally, Nick? If if that were true, that that all of this that we're experiencing is. Uh, a, a simulation either, either just in your mind or that we're all got individual consciousnesses that have been simulated um i, I feel like you know um a bit like we'd be in the matrix or something like that you know everything we thought was reality is is in fact an illusion uh, as real as it looks to us um it's it, it for me it's it's a very unsettling idea in a way but but what's your response to it nick well i mean it depends very much on what kind of simulation this was you could imagine very good ones and very bad ones and all kinds of things in between um i don't think it would necessarily follow though that um all our beliefs about ordinary reality like the appearances of furniture around that that would be an illusion exactly i think um those things would still exist it's just that the nature of their existence would be somewhat different than we had assumed but um it would be i think um, a more natural interpretation to say that we were a li little bit confused about some uh, important questions in ontology, uh, but that our everyday beliefs, they are still, they still track information structure around us. They're still useful for guiding our actions. They're still our best basis for planning what to do next is to look at these patterns we see, whether they're in the simulation or in basement level physical reality, extrapolate from those, build models, etc. So. I don't think if we are in a simulation, then oh, we might just as well go crazy and anything is equally likely to work as anything else. Um, I think it would have some uh, more subtle implications, perhaps, for what we could I expect in in the future and what would make sense to do. But um, that, would, that would require a little bit more kind of work to unearth. Yeah. R Roz, what, what are your thoughts? Because this is the kind of fairly mind-blowing hypothesis, isn't it? What, what's your thoughts on it? Well, I, I used to build simulations, so I've thought a lot about them. And I, I'm curious, you know, behind the simulation, there's usually a purpose for the simulation. There's usually some mind, at least in my experience, uh, you know, building the simulation. Uh, if it's one I built, it doesn't work perfectly, or the computers don't work perfectly. So after you know, so so many days of simulating or weeks of simulating, some of the computers I'm running it on crash, and I have to restart it. And so within the simulation, there's a different time uh, concept than outside of the simulation, right? Depending when you restart and what you reset, uh, there's a lot of attributes of it, and I'm I'm curious. Um, maybe to hear your thoughts on the mind behind a simulation that we could be in. So I think they... What kind of mind do you yeah, think that I mean, suggests? So it would be some kind of super intelligence, presumably, because creating simulations with conscious beings and where the virtual environment is indistinguishable from reality is very hard, like, clearly. It's not something we can currently do. Although computer games are getting better each year in terms of their graphics, but we're still a long way away from that. So I'm imagining that by time, by the time that becomes possible, um, other things will also have become possible, such as cognitive enhancement of biological intelligence and presumably um, machine super intelligence. <clears throat> Even if some simulations were done before you had true machine super intelligence, which I doubt, uh, nevertheless, 
after you have super intelligence, you will be able to build vastly more of these simulations because with super intelligence, you could like just move much more quickly to the limits, um, the technological limits that physics permit. You could colonize the universe, turn planets into supercomputers and so forth. So uh, I think almost all simulations would be built by super intelligences. So that's one thing we can um, infer. Um, regarding their motivations, we could imagine a, a range of different possible motivations for creating simulations. And I think we are uh, somewhat ignorant as to the relative preponderance of these different possible motivations. I mean, you could ask just why, why do humans create uh, simulations and uh, imaginary worlds? And we do it for all kinds of reasons. There's like recreational attempts, right, with video games or, or movies and theater and so forth there. Maybe like you could imagine a histor his historical research, like to kind of explore counterfactuals for history. You could imagine historical tourism, if you want to experience the past, but time travel just doesn't work, right? Because of physics, then the second best thing might be to um, create a kind of recreation of some historical epoch. And then you could kind of uh, inhabit that for some period of time. So like we, we humans do similar things, like historical reenactments is our best effort. If we, if we could make them more realistic, some people probably would. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's a bunch of other things as well that you could imagine, like maybe you could use them for, um, yeah, to, 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 to find out more, more about the origin or the, the forces shaping different kinds of um, AI civilizations to, to, to study how they might have arisen. It's hard talking online, but um, one of my colleagues once said he thought maybe uh, that this world and this life was kind of like a simulation, but it was, but it was real, but it was one of many, a series of them and a series of realities. And we were in this one to have the freedom to make the choice as to whether or not we wanted to go on to the next one. Um, and he was a, he was a Christian, um, believing the next one was, uh, the great beyond that, uh, if you choose to be known by God, you get to go to. And that was, uh, you know, his um, saying that God doesn't want to force that choice on us. Mm -hmm. This is the world where we get to choose freely, whether we accept this free gift of Jesus to uh, accept this loving gift to go to the next one. Because um, we come into this world without that choice, right? We're here. We weren't given that opportunity to say, I want to be here. Uh, but we get the opportunity to say if we want to go to the next one. What do you think of that? Yeah, that that's that's another uh, class of possible reasons for why somebody might create these things um um and, uh, and and you could imagine kind of people wanting a second run uh or uh um you you could imagine yeah all kinds of reasons like m maybe if somebody died early you could imagine creating a simulation where they are allowed to continue out their normal life and then maybe after that um migrate into this larger reality like it, it it's easy to create a lot of different imaginary possibilities what, what's harder to do is to find some way to kind of constrain them and form a very firm expectation for um because ultimately it's a question of numbers here like what would most simulations be like like if, if the universe is sufficiently big with a lot of civilizations probably all of these and many other reasons have actuated some creation of simulation somewhere but we would be most likely to be in the most common type of uh, simulation. So if we are trying to form some it, kind it, of prediction it, it about kind our of own position. It raises here. the whole question, though. It, Go ahead. it does raise the question for me, though, Nick, um, as Rosalind sort of alluded to, of um, the purpose of, of doing this, because uh, it almost feels like such a super intelligence that could simulate an entire universe and our consciousness within it. Um, would almost is almost godlike as far as we're concerned you know and and when i hear people like elon musk and others sort of taking this idea quite seriously that w that we are simply living in a sort of supercomputer simulation I, I kind of almost wonder isn't isn't sort of the traditional god hypothesis that there's a, a di you know a transcendent divine mind behind the universe a kind of more parsimonious potentially explanation than than this idea of a super intelligent alien race or whatever that has created us, which would itself, in a sense, need an explanation and just knock the question one one place back. What's what's your view on all of that, Nick? Uh, they're not mutually exclusive. They could both be true or one or the other could be true or, or, or neither. But 
Um, they don't seem to have any obviously very strong um, evidential relationship to one another. So you could imagine a universe created by God and then in that universe it turns out to be possible to build really powerful computers and some of those get used to create these simulations. Um, I'm not sure that I would say it's not parsimonious. It's not really a postulate brought in in order to motivate something else. It's um, in that respect, I think, I mean, it's, there are these arguments in the history of philosophy that form the basis of a skeptical challenge. Like how can we know that the external world exists, that, it, that we're not dreaming or that it's not all just an illusion. So, so these go back, I mean, to the cart and you can find earlier ancient um, examples of this. But there, the structure is that you kind of start from a position of doubt and then the challenge is prove to me that the external world exists. And, and then there's the philosophy around that. But, but here, rather, we start by assuming that everything is as it appears to be. You know, there are trees and, and trains and there are computers and there are scientists improving the computers and we can study the laws of physics. They seem to suggest you could build much more powerful computers with more advanced technology. And you kind of think through the implications of just taking all of this at face value. And one of those implications seems to be that at some point in the future, you could build extremely powerful computers and you would have the other prerequisites required for creating simulations with gazillions of beings with experiences like ours in them. Many, many more beings than have existed through human history. And then you ask, if that is the case, if, if the world is such that there were all of these many, many orders of magnitude more beings with our experiences in computers than in original history, then where would we most likely be, given that from the inside you couldn't tell the difference? Then uh, appeal to a kind of piece of probabilistic methodology known as anthropics, where it seems like in that kind of situation you should apply a kind of principle of indifference. And so it would follow then from that, that with overwhelming probability, we would be in the simulation. Um, so there is no kind of hmm. extraneous ex assumption you have to, to make uh, in, in order for that reasoning to go through, it seems. There certainly are assumptions, but they are not kind of extraneous. I mean, obviously we are assuming here some form of... Um, substrate independence, that in principle you could implement consciousness on other substrates than biological brains, like for example on silicon computers. Um, so that's sure, kind of sure. yeah, important from philosophy and, of mind. And, and is, that, is that where you, I, I mean, again, I'm detecting a, a kind of a level of, that you're more skeptical about all of this, Roz. Um, and is it because of, again, that, that consciousness issue? <laughs> well, it's speculation, you... yeah, yeah. There's, <laughs> there, where's, the, where's the data? Where's the evidence? <laughs> of this, right? Um, you know, I, it, you're a philosopher, I guess, and, and, and a white male, you get away with a lot of speculation. I have to have data. Uh, <laughs> oh, but, I, but I actually there's, have there's, to, there's, there's plenty of data, with. like, in terms of what kind of um, computational performance does the uh, physics that we have in our universe permit? And so you could do uh, theoretical models, say, of various uh, nanomechanical systems where you can estimate not exactly yeah. but you can sort of estimate a lower bound i've, I've built those problem. models I've, I've built statistical physics models yeah no i know I've, I've built statistical physics models i did my doctorate on statistical physics models simulating you know with probability greater than zero the space of everything that we were trying to create and visual images in the beginning so you know map the whole world visually uh so i i know the math and i also know that it's different than uh, feelings, experience, and consciousness. Uh, we can represent it. Uh, we can symbolically uh, represent it. Uh, we can map it, and we can build gorgeous math, which we also don't know where that comes from. Where does all the beauty of the abstract math come from? I'm curious, too, if the mind that you have behind this, um, if you've thought about how that mind has uh, chosen to create beauty and the aesthetics and the gorgeousness inside you know, very fabulously abstract math because uh, I haven't seen you talk about, about those things, too. Um, one more thing, too, in this simulated uh, world that I think is really interesting is some people have trouble with the concept of miracles. 
in religion. And yet all of that becomes just a snap to explain when you have the ideas you're putting forth with the um, simulation. Um, in fact, I remember talking to Will Wright, a creator of The Sims games, and, you know, he, he controls, right? He can change something in the game. And if we're all just in that game world and the creator reaches in and changes something and it violates all the models we've built within that world of how things work, we might say, you know, that can't happen. Uh, that doesn't fit our physics. That doesn't fit our uh, graphical world models. But it is possible in the larger world, right, when the simulator reaches in. So I, I, I like the idea of the superintelligence uh, out there able to change things in our world. Uh, and but but the uh, ev but I think we should be asking what is the evidence and I think there is evidence um, for the God of the Bible uh, and I'm not sure there's anywhere near as much evidence for some other something out there that's a super intelligence I'm not saying it can't exist I'm just asking about real evidence that you uh, could produce yeah, I mean, so you, you, kind you, of, kind of, you obviously feel it's a, a bit of an extravagance, Ros, but go on, go on, Nick. Go uh -huh. on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you've got to kind of follow along the argument and see where the assumptions come in. And those are the bits that would require evidence, if any. But it sounded like the part of it that you were objecting to was not so much the ones that one would normally think would require evidence, but rather the substrate independence thesis, like... Um, the assumption that, say, these digital minds that could be simulated on digital computers, that they would be able to uh, have all the kinds of experiences that we have. Conscious experiences, including experiences of love and what other favorite emotions that we might point to. Um, so that, I think, is more a philosophical uh, assumption than an empirical one. And uh, um, I... I for the purposes of the simulation argument, like the actual paper doesn't try to defend that at all. It just says this is a common assumption um, amongst, um, in, well, in philosophy of mind and computer science. Um, but if I want to dive into that discussion, then I mean, I could look at kind of say some of the, the more popular or more uh, well-motivated theories of consciousness that we have and see whether they, what they imply about the possibility of instantiating conscious states in computers. So we could look at the, say, global workspace theory or attention schema theory or higher order thought theory. Um, so it seems like a lot of these currently, like most favored theories of consciousness, although by no means all, uh, would imply that a digital implementation would be possible. Yeah, I, I, I just think it's, it's important to keep asking uh, for the evidence and for a distinction between representation and reality. And our reality allows us to do very powerful representations and hypotheticals and simulations and speculations and all of that's wonderful. And uh, I just think it sometimes your statements, it's hard to tell when you're speculating, uh, which I think is a lot of the time, um, which is fine and wonderful. Uh, and when you're talking about facts, uh, they sometimes come across the same way. But it's really important in today's world, especially with all the fake news and the power of it, that we uh, help people under who aren't experts on this to think about what has a lot of evidence for it and what is really just a whole lot of speculation, interesting speculation. Um, but that's what I it mean. Let's talk about another interesting sort of religious perspective on this. Obviously, most world religions have an interest in the idea of immortality, uh, of a life beyond this one. Um, but th there's a sense in which AI, in some views, you know, is potentially able to offer us that in the here and now, um, the transhumanist project, and, and we can sort of define what that is. Um, I mean, but just, just yourself, Nick, I, I mean, I read a really fascinating, it is a few years old now, but a fascinating profile of you in The New Yorker, where it talked about the fact that you, um, I think you're signed up for a sort of cryogenics thing, where if, when you die, if the technology enables it in the future, you could be thawed out and brought back to life. Is, is do you have a sort of desire, even personally yourself, for, for kind of continuing to live a sort of a, an, an immortality in that sense? Well, you, you, 
immortality like that's that's a very long time right uh so i mean that's a really long time i think people jump very quickly from if you would live to more than 80 years then you want to be mortal but there's like a lot of space in between 80 and infinite um so i mean i, I have no idea i mean in, in in truth i think it would mainly depend on the conditions um and then presumably i would not want to decide once and for all but take a little bit at a time and see how it goes and then maybe be in a more informed sure. position to sure. figure out whether you would want another 10 years at that point when you can kind of see what it's like but but would you like uh but i mean is, i'd be fascinated to know is, is is that still an ongoing thing that you'd like to be able to come back in the future if the cryogenics and the technology allowed well i think most uh people signed up for this chronic stuff like the first best thing they would wish for i think would not not be to get sick or to be run over by a car in the first place and this this would be a kind of desperate last resort that may not work but has a maybe a greater chance than than if you're cremated or something like that um of this worldly reanimation um so um so I guess there are different questions one could ask. Well, like one is, is the probability of this actually working a large enough to be worth whatever the costs are? I mean, that's like a financial cost and, and like there's, I guess, a social awkwardness cost or whatever else. Um, and certainly there are many steps where it could fail, even if you think that theoretically with arbitrarily advanced technology you could do it like I mean, the other things like what you could die in the wrong way like lost at sea or something right uh, or the maybe the chronics company would go bust or there's a big revolution that i mean there are many things that could the future might not be interested in reanimate so so, so one question is like is the probability high enough that it's just worth the hassle and the co and then the question of the desirability which is kind of separate from that um, which i think obviously would depend hugely on the circumstances sure sure well well g g given all that obviously th there's a lot of question marks over whether we would want to be awoken in the future um, and whether whether the world is a place we'd want to continue living in but i i guess the, the interesting thing for me is that ai also holds out the possibility but again the question is is this this just sci-fi or is this sci fact um of you know digitally uploading our consciousness uh you know to the memory banks of some cloud uh, whereby we could potentially live forever. I mean, it, again, it's been explored a great deal recently in shows like Black Mirror and others, where they've they've imagined this possibility of of people effectively, when they their physical bodies wear out, they simply go to a sort of digital nirvana. Um, I mean, and, and in that sense, it, it's it's interesting, isn't it? That that it's almost as though AI technology is almost taking the place of religion in that sense, in kind of fulfilling the promises that have traditionally been seen as as those of of faith of of a kind of future life a life uh, everlasting and so on what well, i mean is that um what, what i suppose what's what's behind that drive do you think nick for people to want to to kind of be able to to sort of live forever in a sort of digital space in that kind of way um i uh... I don't know exactly. I mean, I think there is like some mundane level of motivation, like most of us just put on a seatbelt because we don't want to die or get injured in a car crash. And, you know, we avoid the most unhealthy food because or smoking because we think we might get cancer. And like there's just a kind of commonsensical desire that most people have, if, assuming their lives are sort of reasonably OK to prefer to to live and be healthy. And so for some people i think it's just like an extrapolation of that that maybe they see this is like a possible um additional means by which you could increase the amount of expected future life that you have in this life in this world um uh, and and then it's a cost benefit thing like so depending on whatever how, how, how rich they are maybe if it's a very small fraction of their income that would have to go to pay the life insurance premium every month and they would rather give up a, a cappuccino every day and have this that then gives them x percent chance um i'm, I'm sure that for some people it, that might be a more complicated or idiosyncratic psychological thing where they need some 
maybe, maybe they are not religious and they still have a psychological need for some straw to cling on to that could give them hope. I, I, I don't want to speculate as to the kind of deep psychological roots for all of these people. Um, I mean, the most striking thing, if anything, is maybe just how few people are. I mean, it's this chronic thing has been around for many decades now, right? And it's still very much a niche. It's growing, but it's like a very slow linear rate. Um, and you'd think that we just see like t t the state of technology is becoming more advanced. A lot of these other ideas that were really out on the fringes uh, 20, 30 years ago are now kind of like great advances in, in AI, nanotech, synthetic biology, VR, like all of these things now seem like, oh yeah, we are making progress. A lot of people think, yeah, maybe even this stuff about the simulation, right? That's become quite mainstream. Like a lot of people are tweeting and blogging. Elon Musk is tweeting. And, um, but, but for some reason, chronic still remains this kind of uh, just as much a niche thing today as it, as it did back in, in the nineties. Uh, that, that mm. maybe is more the thing that's that to interesting. Me, yeah. Uh, strikes me as needing explanation. Yeah. What, what do you think Ros, about this idea of a sort of, you know, could, could AI technology be the future to a, a form of immortality again i guess there's a lot of speculation there um but and, and a lot of sci-fi dramas do hang on this idea that you could in principle upload one's consciousness into some mm -hmm. digital format uh which again is something a very well if it's happening it's a, it's a long way off and there's the question of whether it could happen at all anyway but um but what's your i, I i'd be interested in your general thoughts on this whole concept yeah i you know there there could in the future be, you know, deep fake synthetic versions of each of us having this talk right now. And then also taking every other digital form of talks or typing all of our Google takeout, everything we've searched for, or texted or written an email to somebody on, uh, that can be recomposited into a synthetic being that uh, plays as, a, as an agent with somebody you could talk to. We've already been doing this in the MIT Media Lab. You know, you build a little agent that's for the deceased professor and ask what that one would have thought, right? Actually, one is a Marvin Minsky bot, and he's one of the ones who also signed up for cryogenics, and that hasn't um, resurrected him yet, but we can resurrect some of what he said online with a digital form. And it's a kind of immortality, right? I find it interesting, though, that we, uh, so many people I know who aren't, uh, you know, who haven't thought that much about God or what they believe in the afterlife still desire it. It's almost like we're made for it, right? Like that, you know, some, some people say, you know, you're hungry because you're, you're made to eat food, you're thirsty, you're made to, to drink. Um, maybe we are, uh, there's something in us that is immortal, that desires immortality. We, uh, you know, like um, Seneca saying, the Greek philosopher saying, we are we are like mortals in what we fear and like immortals in what we desire. We uh, seem to have something in us that seeks that beyond. Uh, at the same time, I don't think a lot of us have thought about it that deeply, what we do in that beyond. And there is a worry, you know, if you have an infinite number of grandchildren, you know, how are you going to attend all those birthday parties, right? <laughs> you know, there, there are some practical elements that are, uh, you know, that we don't understand. We don't know how we're going to deal with. Uh, but yeah, there's this almost universal desire for it. Yes. Um, I mean, d d does the concept, Nick, of, of everyone choosing at some point to, to live in, you know, to just keep living, uh, whether it be in physical bodies by that time, you know, maybe the technology is there that you can implant your consciousness into a robot and we can continue living in the physical world. Uh, or, or it's otherwise in some kind of digital space where, you know, we can create our own reality and, and have a lovely ever after. I mean, again, it's a subjective question, but does that is, is that a good thing as far as you're concerned? Or, or do you worry at the idea of sort of just carrying on and on and on because technology allows us to? Um, yeah, I mean, I I. I I don't know exactly how long would be the optimal um, lifespan. I think it certainly would seem to depend a lot on the conditions. Like, so first of all, I think our intuitions about the desirability of longer than usual lives are shaped very heavily by the fact that in this world, uh, older age is 
associated with worse health, right? So you you, ne you never really get people much above a hundred who are in perfect mental condition and fully productive and run marathons and stuff like it. So we just see this very strong association that at a certain point we just fall apart, and it, it's kind of sad. And you certainly don't want to just extrapolate that and then think we want a hundred more years where you're sort of kept alive on some respirator sure. and like the whole medical team is kind of that, that, that seems utterly pointless. So we have to, first of all, ex exert the, the, the mental push to imagine a different condition where you would actually, maybe you would get stronger every year and healthier and learn more and, and get new capabilities. And that, that already seems to quite radically change the aspect of, of, of this scenario. Um, I mean, it's kind of sad, I think that we start early in life at our peak and then at a certain point we go down like if anything one would maybe think you would want to start at the bottom and then go up but anyway so so that would be one variable and then of course the world we live um in and w what other people might also be there like another thing is you think if i lived longer but everybody else everybody i cared about my friends and family they were all dying off to a lot of people that doesn't seem very appealing because they imagine themselves be lonely and so forth but in a scenario where many together could do this, continue the adventure, then maybe that flips. Maybe you don't, if everybody else is going to go on and continue the adventure, you would feel, I don't want to lose out. Like if everybody else, if the party is still going, you get the FOMO effect, right? So without yeah. like adding a lot of these specifications, it's hard to evaluate it positively or negatively. Um, and then I would say on top of that, though, like if we consider really radically long, even long finite lifespans, like a million years or something like that, let, let alone infinite time, that then I think it becomes even harder uh, because those are just so, so far beyond what, uh, what, what, what we are normally assuming when, when we are thinking about living but, or dying. But it, it does sound to me a little bit, Nick, like you regret the fact that we do live in this sort of physical body which does wear out you you it sounds like if there was a way of stopping that you would welcome it you the, you're you don't want life to wear out you don't I mean, want so certainly to if there were like an anti like a pill that postponed the aging i'd be happy like i mean and people try right with creams and everything like snail extracts from korea like every, every possible means right that if, if there were ways of not just <laughs> preventing it from showing up but of actually preventing the cellular degradation I'm, I'm sure once that technology exists it will be extremely popular even amongst those people who now kind of dismiss it as saying oh that's this kind of hubristic thing we wouldn't want to have anything to do with it's easy to say when no anti-aging medicine actually exists but what, once it's there like do you want to have worse knees year by year and like an aching hip or would you want to have a good hip and good knees and like a good heart and all your neurons still there like i mean it seems like an easy choice it it, it, it it's it's a fascinating question because at one level ros that's kind of what you're involved in you're involved in helping people live happier healthier longer lives mm -hmm. with ai with the technology you've developed but where does this line exist between what's healthy and what's not healthy when it comes to you know encouraging some huge long lifespan which seems so out of keeping with our normal human condition in that sense it's a great question we had a big effort at at the MIT Media Lab years ago called Human 2.0. And it had a physical component with Hugh Hare and his biomechatronics, you know, replacing limbs and giving, this one woman walked in and her legs were so amazing. I'm like, wow, look at, I, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm a happily married heterosexual woman and I'm, I'm admiring this other woman's legs. Um, and it turned <laughs> out they were artificial uh, and they were gorgeous. Wow. And she said, I don't know why people say I don't have any legs. I have six pair, you know. And she she had legs that could do all these different amazing things. I mean, she clearly and Hugh can climb rocks brilliantly and even better with some of the different legs he's built. So we know we can physically augment in amazing ways that uh, you know could maybe make it so that I don't need to take a car or train from Boston to New York. I could walk and burn off uh, and justify eating more delicious, fattening things uh, without getting fat. So there are all kinds of ways we could augment ourselves. But we, um, we were also looking, in my case, at the cognitive affective augmentation. We have a lot of efforts in our lab on that. Can we augment our memory? Can we augment our emotion regulation? Could we help people on the autism spectrum who have difficulty interpreting emotional 
signals, especially in real time. You know, maybe they're concentrating hard to understand your words and they can't read the ocean waves, 10,000 other patterns of things changing on your face. The complexity of which in a two-way conversation quickly dwarfs not just the moves in chess, but the moves in go for all the possible combinations. It's, it's just, it grows so fast. It's so hard for a person to comprehend it and for a computer to comprehend it. And we, uh, we, as we learn about it, we realize how incredibly complicated all this stuff is and how little we really understand it uh, and how hard it is to help people today, much less augment ourselves in the future. But we think it's a really worthy goal for AI. And the more people maybe who work on those, call them more AI for good causes, you know, to help augment and expand human abilities, maybe the fewer people will work on the AI for bad causes that just make the rich richer and the, and exert more control over people and don't treat them with justice. I, I guess the, the, the question that hangs over it all is, um, yeah, would we want, what, what kind of a world are we wanting to live forever in as well? Um, and, and indeed, I suppose as a Christian, do, do you see that kind of desire to to live to live on um uh, to to potentially kind of live forever and that sort of thing is is that is that something that, that could happen uh, and would you welcome that or is that actually just an echo as you've said of uh, an ultimate desire that you think can only really be fulfilled you know in god in a kind of a new creation as as a christian would see it yeah it's interesting i i mean personally i don't desire to live an infinite uh, life I do desire, however, to get to the next one, <laughs> the one where I can see God face to face. I mean, what a mind blowing idea. You know, I, um, I don't know 100% that that's true. And my guess is that we very imperfectly understand what has been revealed through the Bible. Uh, so probably we have a bunch of it wrong because we just see through a glass darkly. But we do we are held out this possibility that there is uh, a life beyond this where we are loved or we are known where we can know the super mind the super the true super intelligence be, uh, beyond all beyond all space and time and to me the opportunity to meet that super intelligence is so exciting that even if it's just for a moment i you know would like to uh, would like to see about getting there um, so mm, I do find myself desiring that. And I think that's consistent with what I read, you know, and learn from a Christian worldview. Sure. I mean, it, it sounds like the closest thing, Nick, that you believe to in God in terms of is is potentially a super intelligence that we are the creation of, albeit not the, the same one that Roz has in mind. Um, would you like, if the, if it is the case that we're we're living in some kind of, you know, simulation, would you like to be able to meet that super intelligence one day? Would would that be a, a goal that you aspire to? I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure whether that's the closest in my belief space either to um, what Rosalind was talking about. Um, I I do fundamentally feel though that uh, in, in inadequate to try to actually form a firm opinion about a lot of these things. Um, and I don't really mean this modestly either. It's not as if I think a lot of other people out there are like so much more qualified than me either. I think we're all like these little creatures who are like in a vast world that we understand very little of and until very recently understood even less. So presumably, even if we're just allowed with our own small brains to continue for another few hundred years, we'll probably figure out some pretty cool stuff. And then beyond that, there are presumably many, many more things that we have no chance of figuring out with our little brains. Um, and um, so it, it seems likely that we've overlooked at least one crucial consideration like something some argument or idea or insight or fact that if only we became aware of it and took it properly into account would kind of radically change our whole picture of of what we should be doing our whole stack of priorities like it seems kind of a little implausible that we've now found the last crucial consideration it, it, and we've got uh, it figured uh, so and and by that do you mean that, that you're you you you're not prepared to be as certain in that sense that there's a god that will answer all these questions you you think that there's 
I mean, I was fascinated and maybe that we can start to just wrap it up here, but there's a paragraph on your website, Nick, where, where it says is almost exactly what you just said, which is in terms of directing our efforts as a civilization, it would seem useful to have some notion of which direction is up and which is down, what we should promote and what we should discourage. I believe it's likely we're overlooking one or more crucial considerations, ideas or arguments that might plausibly reveal the need for not just some minor course adjustment in our endeavours, but a major change of directional priority. And those seeking to make the world better should therefore take it as important to get to the bottom of these matters or else to find some way of dealing wisely with our cluelessness if it is inescapable. So, what I mean, I, I guess it's hard to, 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 to envision what that course change might be what that big thing is we might be missing but are you saying that there's you, you think we're only sort of at, in the foothills of where our understanding of mind and technology and everything where it could ultimately lead us as, as human beings is, is that the idea yeah and i think we know a lot of details but there might be some crucial things about how all of these details fit together the overall picture it's revealed i mean just take this simulation argument like suppose for the sake of this discussion that it's actually right then until that was discovered that would just be this massive piece uh, like of information about the world that we were oblivious to up until just two decades ago and and what why think that would be the last such thing and like um theology could be one source of these there might be many other places as well where these kind of um earthquakes in our uh worldview could arise from um but I don't think we've seen the last. And so one feels a kind of ultimate sense of um, dependency uh, of like hoping that things works out. Like, uh, um, and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, a kind a, of hu humility. A sense of in, humility in a sense as well. It, it's been such a good discussion. Could uh, Any final thoughts as we start to, to wrap up this, this uh, program today, Ros? Well, I just wish we could uh, meet in person and continue the conversation. Uh, Nick, I have a lot more questions for you probably than the audience wants to wants to hear. Yeah. Well, well, ultimately, you know, technology has enabled us in the midst of a pandemic to to have this conversation, which is great. So we know that technology certainly serves great purposes very often. Um, all the best as you both go go on with your work um trying to make sure that technology continues to serve humanity and not to hinder it um but uh, it's been such a great conversation today uh so nick and ros thank you very much for being my guests on the big conversation thank you justin thanks for hosting Well, I hope you enjoyed today's big conversation from Unbelievable. But what did you think of the discussion? I'd love you to tell me by filling out a brief survey. It's multi-choice and really quick. You can also receive bonus video content and updates from the series by subscribing to our newsletter at thebigconversation.show. So links for both the survey and bonus content are in the info with today's video. Thank you for watching and see you soon.